From Software's game design changed everything. The whole thing. From Software's game design has had a undeniable and profound effect on not only the gaming industry, what, but yeah, the, the industry of uh, Jacobs, the, of it, people named Jacobs, such as myself. With the massive success oh. of Elden Ring, From Software has further established him. that a merciless, uncompromising gameplay first design philosophy with little hand holding or assistance can also still be a massive success that millions of people will connect with bro i saw a five on that screen i saw a 10 i said i said what the who the fuck who the fuck gave this game a five but i realized it was five out of five please show the kid please show him absolutely adore i am ah. certainly one of those millions and while typically brilliant I also believe that From Software's games are unfortunately far from perfect. Yeah. And Elden Ring yeah, that's is- Yeah, it's true. That specific boss was such a piece of shit. Royal Ratathor, you have to kill the four rats and then he comes down. Holy fuck, what a terrible boss. Sadly, no exception. And I want to talk about it. But first, I must warn you that I will be spoiling the absolute Moonlight Greatsword out of all of these games. So if you haven't experienced them for yourself, particularly Elden Ring, I strongly suggest you hit pause on this video and go savor that experience first and come back in about 200 hours no, because please. it is quite possibly the greatest experience I have had. Is that how much time you put 200 in? Hours. Oh shit, yo, this guy, oh wow hours because it is quite possibly the greatest experience I have had yeah. playing a video game in my 28 years of holding a player yeah, Elden two Ring top 10 greatest video games of all time it's not even a question Mad Cat's controller that isn't actually plugged in. Regardless, I believe it is no exaggeration to say that in the world of video games from software has truly changed everything. Demon's Souls was released in 2009 for the PlayStation 3 and was nothing like other big games coming out at the time, especially in 2009. In a year where games were becoming more and more cinematic and accessible and forgiving to a casual audience, Demon's Souls crawled out of a wet crypt and said, I will kill you. Demon's Souls, well, Demon Souls was a fucking joke game. It was super easy. What, I died once on Flameworker and that was it? Like, that shit was a joke. The reason why it was good is because people don't want to sit around and watch a shittily fucking written movie whenever they want to play a video game. Like, yeah, we'll sit through it for Final Fantasy 16 because it's Final Fantasy 16. But I don't want to do this as a regular thing. Like all the Souls games that came after it is a very challenging and unforgiving video game. A difficulty that fans of the series often lovingly oh, refer shit. to as hard but fair. Yep. Except mm. for them. Except then so they let's, grab you. Let's maybe settle on hard, but oh, mostly God. fair. After joining FromSoft in 2004 and working as a coder on the Armored Core series, Hidetaka Miyazaki took over That's as director guy. on a struggling high fantasy project that was running into some serious issues during development. Because the project was already seen as a failure inside the studio, Miyazaki was basically like, I'm gonna take this thing and I'm gonna take it in, I'm gonna take it out back to the garage. I'm gonna do some stuff to it. Inspired by FromSoft's own Kingsfield series, Miyazaki wanted to make a dark fantasy gameplay-driven experience in collaboration with Sony Japan Studio. A challenging but rewarding experience that took gaming back to its basics, something he felt was dying out at the time. During Bro, development- I remember those games. I always, you know I've never actually beaten a Castlevania game? I wanna go back and play all of them. Because I love the aesthetic of Castlevania, I've never beaten one. Miyazaki actually tried to keep the harsh difficulty aspect on the low from publisher Sony, fearing that they might want to change it for being a bit too extreme, yeah. much like a BMX riding video game that sucked. Breaking down the basic gameplay of Demon's Souls will effectively break down the basic gameplay for all of the Souls games yep. that followed because the very core design pillars have gone largely unchanged. It starts with a character creator that, before you say anything, I know, it, it gets better with time, that lets you pick I a start- really good like for a 2009 character creator that's decent man 
Starting class, dictating your capabilities with yeah. different weapons or magic. A third Especially person lock on camera system for combat that improves on the Z targeting system that Ocarina of Time introduced back in uh, 0098 that you can control the camera and attack people at the same time, which was kind of a breakthrough in and of itself. Animation based combat that requires you to commit to each action and wait until the animation finishes before you can do something else, yep. along with managing how that action affects your stamina bar or in the case of、mm -hmm. casting spells, your magic bar. But I didn't raise you to cast no spells. This is a Claymore household just like my father and his father before him. A dodge roll. I really hate how people act like magic is the way that smart people play these games because I've never seen a person more fucking brain dead than the people that play magic in From Software games. Because every game that they have that has magic is completely fucking unbalanced. There's like three spells that one shot bosses. You don't even need to be alive. And then somebody, like, I mean, it,、uh, personally, like, not in game. You have to be alive in game. But I mean, you could be dead in real life. And all you have to do is hit one key and the boss dies. Contains invincibility frames or iframes, meaning that if you time your dodge right, nothing can possibly hurt you.、Yeah. Similar to action games like Devil May Cry. Corpse running, where if you die, you drop all the currency you've racked up from killing enemies and you gotta make it back to that spot without dying, otherwise, you lose it forever. Passive and non passive online interaction, where other players can leave helpful tips. Or、uh, whatever the opposite of a helpful tip is, along with summoning、yeah. or being summoned as a random cooperator、Try、to help, or invasions to either kill or be、I、killed. Kill you. And、yep. you know, the gameplay of each individual Souls game obviously goes a lot deeper than that、mm -hmm. with different complex systems and healing items and stupid convoluted bullshit like world tendency that you need a fing master. Yeah, yeah, they, that's why they never did that again. And I think they even changed World Tendency in the remake、uh, for the, the PS5. So, yeah, obviously they got rid of it because it was stupid. But I, I think really one of the reasons why I like Dark Souls games and the From Software games is because I don't have to sit through a bunch of fucking menus, cutscenes, and bullshit. <laughs> like, I want to play a game. Like, whenever I, start, whenever I load up Super Mario World, there's like that thing where everybody's there and there's like a few guys jumping around. They're like, Mario, Mario, you've got to save the world. And then you go save the world. And it takes like five minutes. Like, you don't have to go through six levels of backstories of some fucking person's writing. Oh, this is like the whole, like, what is, oh, God, bro, where's the boss? Where's the boss? Is he over there? No. Oh, fuck, there's a cutscene. Oh, shit. Fuck, got another one. Oh, God, it's a loading screen for another cutscene. Oh, shit. Right? It's about the gameplay. I love the gameplay games. That's why, like, for example, what was the game that I recently played?、Uh, is it like. Any game that has almost no dialogue and is just gameplay, I'm having fun. Now, I'm not saying I, I loved Final Fantasy XVI. It was great. Halls of Torment. Yeah, there's no bullshit. It's like Halls of Torment. You start the game. All right, there's the door. Well, what are you waiting for? Go through the door. And that's it. There's not some four score and seven years ago, there was the invasion of the skeletons, and that is whenever the king. Well, you have to understand the king's father. Oh, fuck. Oh, God. Degree to understand. But the challenging and methodical combat system. Oh, that bro, has always fuck these mobs. Been the beating heart of all of these games. A heart that's married to a, another heart. Exploration. You know how in my、yeah. Rockstar's game design video, I really harp on how those games constantly berate you with hyper specific instructions and yellow map markers and assume you have the IQ of a tiny baby rat? Yeah, the soul. You probably, I mean, most people who play those games, I mean, they're made for a large audience. Those games do like the exact polar opposite. The tiny baby rat is now actually a boss, and、oh, yeah. you have no idea what the f is going on. And what makes exploration so compelling in Demon Souls and really all Souls games is that it is true、out. exploration that、yeah. really makes you feel like you don't、Batman. have an over map. No, it really makes you feel like an explorer. There is、wow. no detailed map that you can rely on and consult. Only your own sense of direction and understanding of a space. This,、yep. along with a strong challenge and an actual fear of 
Tower Knight having something is such a good to lose, fight. but the corpse running system makes discoveries and victories feel that much more meaningful and rewarding. Because you really feel like you, the player, actually charted and conquered a space and overcame a significant challenge instead of just what well, it's a, it's a, they give the player agency over their own outcomes because whenever victory is guaranteed victory isn't earned so you don't really feel good for just follow the yellow dot okay and i'm here all right okay so that's okay i did it wow Congratulations, you beat the game. Watching f***ing Wally do it in a cutscene. The Souls games have very few cutscenes or long, yeah. unskippable passages of dialogue by NPCs or RPG conversation trees where your choice actually doesn't really matter. Instead, yeah. the story is discovered and slowly unraveled by the player through observing their environment and reading item descriptions and inevitably watching Vati video. You know, it reminds me, remember whenever I thought that we were going to get DLC for uh, Demon Souls? For the PS5. Remember whenever I thought that? Yeah, those are the good days, man. Those are the good days. Videos because I don't understand any of this. So you're saying the rat was like a king at some point? or yeah. I appreciate Miyazaki's approach to storytelling, though, because it's very unique to the medium of video games and was actually inspired by his real-life experience of reading English-language sci-fi and fantasy books as a kid that he couldn't fully understand but would fill in the gaps using yeah. his imagination. The story is so much more about the general mood and atmosphere and feeling of exploring a place rather than scripted plot points or set pieces. The innovative online elements of summoning random strangers to help you out was actually inspired by Miyazaki's real life as well. Where after his car was trapped in snow on a hill, a random group of strangers showed up and helped push the car out of the snow and then mysteriously drifted off into the night like ghosts drifting in and out of his world at a well, port. Spontaneous and serendipitous interactions are what people remember. Because if something is programmed to occur and you know it's going to occur, it doesn't feel the same. It doesn't feel good. Because sometimes you'll have like invaders that do crazy things. Sometimes you'll have Malcolm Reynolds who gets into your game and you actually have to restart the whole game because you picked up one of his corrupted file things and he probably logged your IP address. Uh, sometimes you'll have, you know, a guy who's even dumber than you are and you can kill him. Like it's, everything is exciting because you don't know what's gonna happen and it's truly random. I think it's kind of, um, like Elden Ring had a very, I still don't know if it was the right decision to, can't you, I, I'm pretty sure you're not able to by default invade players unless they have another player with them. A unless that player opts into being solo invaded. I'm trying, I, it was a long time ago, so I don't really remember, correct, yes. Like, I don't know if that was the right decision or not. I I don't know. I still have to think about it. I kind of, like, I understand it, but maybe they should have changed it later on. You have to enable through an item. PP, yeah, and it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. The frame pace 30 frames per second. Yeah, These overall, games also have so some cool technical issues. Demon Souls was not an immediate success. Sony yeah. decided to not publish it in North America after feeling pretty negatively about it before its release. During the Tokyo Game Show in 2008, Sony president Shuei Yoshida played it for two hours couldn't get past the starting area and then stopped playing and said, this is an unbelievably bad video game. <laughs> this is the... No way, is that true? That's got to be bullshit, right? It's true? No way. What the fuck? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that just makes me appreciate the, you know, the Devil May Cry guy from Final Fantasy 16 team. Where it's like, I remember I didn't know, like, oh, how's this guy? Like, okay, the developer's gonna play the boss. Oh, what the fuck is this gonna be? And then immediately the first attack, he perfect parries it. And it's like, oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, he made... Okay, yeah, he made this game. 
Same guy that years later would Platinum Bloodborne, and that game is like way harder. So spoiler alert, From Software changed everything. The yeah, titular line. It wasn't him. until later in 2009 when Atlas would publish the game in North America that sales he would slowly start to pick That's up funny. and critics would start to take notice. Western audiences generally loved it because apparently we're all sick, masochistic bastards, and GameSpot even gave it their Game of the Year, the same year that Uncharted 2 and Modern Warfare 2 came out. But along with established- yeah, I always say, like, I think Demon's Souls like it's a great game but i feel like too many of the bosses were experimental like i i didn't think it was like a super insanely great game it was just like a very solid good game that's it the core pillars of what a Souls game would be. It's important Game's to talk fun, about just yeah. how brave Miyazaki from Software and the Sony yeah. Japan Studio were for making such a different kind of game. Demon Souls was a huge risk, an imperfect, weird, brutal passion project that was expected by everyone to flop but refused to compromise. <laughs> fans spent like hours there, bro. That shit was so funny. I remember he banned like 50 people. I was laughing my ass off watching that stream on its design goals and eventually found an audience that really connected with it. And two console generations later, an extremely faithful remake was published by Sony as a launch title for the PlayStation 5. And I'll say again, I played the remake on release, and also in the remake you can get the Penetrator's armor, it's a, a change. Um, the remake was so good that it completely changed my outlook on if remakes are good for games or not. I thought it was insanely good. There you have it. That's uh, that's it. That's the end. It's the, it's the only game they ever made. Yep. Oh, this one came out on the PS2. I love Dark Souls. But... I also hated Dark Souls. Yeah. My brother Isaac had played Dark Souls sometime after its release in 2011 and had repeatedly told me to brother. play it. I eventually finally tried it, uh, got past the tutorial section after a lot of struggling, made it to Firelink Shrine, wandered the wrong way into a graveyard full of skeletons, as I know a lot of people did. That graveyard <laughs> eventually became a dark f tunnel of skeletons that uh, killed me a bunch of times, Ooh. and then I promptly said F this game and stopped playing. <laughs> I can't remember for yeah, what- Yeah, I could see that. That makes a lot of sense. Definitely, yep, went the wrong way. Understandable. Exact reason, but a year or two later, I tried the game again, probably mm -hmm. because of my brother's insistence once again. The bastard he is. And uh, it was different. This time, it stuck. Not only did it yeah. stick, but it seriously changed my life. I know that sounds super... I've had games like that, too, where, like, I play them, like, just a little bit, and I fucking hate them, and then I come back way later on, and I play them more, and I, I actually appreciate them a lot. Uh, an exception to that was Dark Souls 2. I, I originally played it, and I hated it, and then I came back, and I played the entire thing, and uh, I hated it even more whenever I finished it. Sekiro was like, yeah, Sekiro was like that for me. Dramatic, but like, it completely changed the way I look at video games and why I like to play them and made me want to talk about them more and examine them. And it yeah. absolutely ruined most other video games for me because- That's one fact for me. It's like, after I see how fair that these games are, whenever another game hits me by something that I'm not in, oh, I'm pissed. I'm so fucking mad because it's like, I was out of this. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? I, I well, How am I getting hit by this? This is bullshit. Once I finished it, nothing could fill the giant rat boss size in, in my heart. Now, if I were to go into all of the reasons why Dark Souls is so significant in gaming history, we would be here all day and my editor would absolutely hate that. I am going to kill you. But on my road to eventually talking about Elden Ring, I do need to touch on three crucial aspects that vastly improved on Demon Souls game design. Super Exploration DX Turbo Edition with fuckles. Estes yep. Flask, I hardly know her as best as- Bro, that grass shit? <laughs> That is so fucking dumb, bro. Like, I hated that stupid ass grass. As I can. Souls. And yeah. atmosphere, atmosphere, you've been seen. I feel you inside my screen. I, 
<laughs> I, I also didn't like that. What I mean by Super Exploration DX Turbo Edition with fuckles is that Dark Souls fundamentally changed how level design and world design worked within this gameplay formula that Demon Souls established. While Demon Holes over here had a hub world that let you freely fast travel to different zones of varying locales and difficulty levels, Dark Souls over here took a lot of its zones and stacked them on top of each other like a stack of pants. I've had an unpopular take that a lot of people disagree with, but I think that Dark Souls 1 is pretty much an open world game. Pretty much it is. And that's because of how interconnected and well designed the map is. Pancakes and made sure that even if some pancakes have chocolate chips or some pancakes have bananas, that they all seamlessly flow into each other and make sense as one cohesive world in this beautiful interconnected short stack of pancakes. The Blight Town is like a pancake made out of pigeons. <laughs> During the first half of the game, you have no fast travel, and all of the areas are connected in multiple complex ways like a maze. So there's this palpable sense of danger and tension that slowly so rises as you venture deeper and deeper into this beautiful, mysterious world that is very- And it's also like, it's it that dying, you have to go all the way back. That's also the issue is that it's like you didn't want to die not only because you die but also because then you have to go all the way back and you might not have like you know this is whenever you first start playing a game so like you don't have a lot of resources very clearly inspired by berserk which is amazing that tension is brilliantly paired with the new edition of bonfires resting yes. points that let you catch your breath for a second and spend your hard-earned currency from fighting enemies and bosses mm -hmm. on leveling up your stat points and refilling your much needed estus flask That's i am right. of the pretty firm opinion that the healing mechanics found in demon souls and bloodborne and kind of dark souls 2 are vastly inferior to the standard estus flask system found in the other Souls games. The I completely fucking agree. I don't think that they have made a single... Nice weapon choice, by the way. I don't think that they have made a single... Like, the blood vials was garbage. Uh, the fucking life gems were garbage. And the grass was garbage. That's it. Blood vial farming sucked. Well, it simultaneously sucked and didn't suck. Because whenever you were bad at the game, it sucked. But whenever you got better, because the, the price of blood vials was the same. It was like 200 or 400 per vial or something like that. So at the very beginning, like, you, you know, the, the one, like, the way that I remember farming them is like you would kill, like, those two big guys and then, like, reset over and over to get 20. But, like, later on in the game, you just always have 20. It's never a big deal because you have so many, uh, uh, so many runes. Estus has a specific amount of healing charges that you can increase throughout the course of the Price game. And the only way to refill your charges is by resting at a bonfire, which also respawns all enemies in the I area. Not only does this provide an extra incentive to seek out and discover bonfires and push on while exploring, but it solves the dumbass problem those other games have where your healing items are a finite currency that you can run out of. Meaning that if you're struggling with the game and you keep dying, and you will, you will likely have to halt progression just to go grind mobs of weaker enemies for yeah. healing items or currency that you can then spend on healing items and not leveling up, which feels so unnecessarily punishing in a game. I, I completely agree. I've always really, really hated punishment mechanics, like insult to injury mechanics. You're having a bad day and then the game decides to piss on you a little bit more where enemies do this to you. With the Estus, you at least know that for the next bit, you have a guaranteed specific amount yeah, of heal. And much losing. like a survival horror game, the goal is to get to the next area using as little Estus as best as you can. I think one of the greatest single improvements over demon holes over here is yeah. the atmosphere. I will never forget how it felt to get lost in this world. Struggling my... Uh, Boletaria versus... Uh, fucking like, what, would it, what was it? Uh, Lordran. I feel like, yeah, the Dark Souls aesthetic is better. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Definitely.
ass off through Undead Burg and Undead Parish and finally being rewarded by finding that shortcut back to Firelink Shrine and hearing that comforting music creep in. That that seriously changed the trajectory of my firstborn yeah, son's life. Boring, he's he's yeah. getting into brown now. Journeying all the way down like, to... I also think that, by the way, uh, like Dark Souls, the first half of Dark Souls 1 is one of the greatest gaming experiences of all time. The second half is good. That's about it. First the depths, and then Blight Town, and then finding the entrance that's a secret to the Great Hollow, and making my way down that, and finally ending up at Ash Lake gave me Place a feeling that I will forever cherish. Yeah. The inability to easily fast travel back up to Firelink Shrine after I journeyed all the way down there simultaneously had me terrified and also in complete awe oh, of yeah. the vertical scope of this world. And there's so much of this game that you can just completely hype. miss. From Software doesn't care if every player sees all of the content that they yeah. made for this game and that makes finding the stuff that you do find feel that much more special and memorable. Well, I, I remember like in Elden Ring, it's like, so yeah, there's this one area um, and so if you hit a wall, there's like a treasure chest behind the wall. But if you jump over the treasure chest and you hit another wall, there's another invisible wall. And behind that invisible wall, there's a third invisible wall. And if you break through all three of these invisible walls, there's like a whole new zone with like five bosses and like six quest lines and like all this other stuff. And so like you might not, you, you might miss it. It's just all smoke and mirrors so and code and textures, but the illusion that From Software sells here is a powerful one. Except for some clearly unfinished areas towards the end of the game, but those don't exist. You made Lost is a live up. Gaslight, gaslight, gaslight. Unlike D I wish that they, um, like, I don't think we've had a mod so far for Dark Souls uh, 1 that's really redone Lost Isolith in a way that I think is uh, true to form. Like Demon's Souls, was Dark Souls was a pretty instant success. Critics loved it, and the game reached a much larger audience right off the bat, thanks to Bandai Namco publishing it all over the world on PS3 yep. and Xbox 360 and PC, with one of the most janky PC ports to ever exist. Shout that. out Games for Windows Live, RIP. This also annoyingly led to so many industry heads resorting to the phrases, it's like Dark Souls, or this Souls is the Dark Souls yeah. of oh, blank, yeah. when in reality, all they're trying to say is that it's hard. Going to Arby's is like the Dark Souls of going to Carl's Jr. <laughs> huh? That's actually true. You ever get your change back from Arby's and it's the right amount? Y'all ever have that happen? I haven't. Knight is very clearly inspired by From yeah, Software's approach, tip. and that game is undoubtedly the greatest Metroidvania ever made. I fucking love Hollow Knight, primarily because it perfected like a design the... aspect from Dark Souls 1 that From Software themselves kind of started to abandon with subsequent Souls games non linear exploration. Shut up already! Jesus, that guy loves to talk! Hi, I'm Jakey, Jakey, and Jakey, attorneys at law! Here at Jakey, Jakey, and Jakey, we have a lot of expenses. And a lot of those expenses are monthly subscriptions that we totally forget we're even paying for. Well, today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is here to help. Rocket Money is an all in one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. This personal finance app allows you to manage subscriptions, lower bills, build a custom budget, and grow your savings all in one place. We personally- I can't believe people need this shit, but they do. I didn't even know this was a thing, but apparently people sign up for shit, and they don't even realize that they've signed up for it. And they're, they're paying out $35, $55 a month to a subscription to Maple Story. <laughs> that like one time they got drunk in 2017 and signed up for. Only use it to identify and securely cancel recurring charges or unwanted subscriptions, all with the simple tap of a finger. Which is a godsend for the social anxiety of having to actually call people on the phone to cancel stuff. What is this, fucking 1882? Columbus sailed the oceans 11? We also use it to track our monthly spending and set budgets. Rocket Money notifies us if we exceed that budget, along Ooh. with showing our spend to earn ratio every month, quarter, or year. Ooh. Also, if you're like us and gonna turn 29 this year, maybe you're starting to pay a 
little bit more attention to your credit score. Well, Rocket Money alerts you of important changes to your score and also offers you insight. I don't even know. I don't even think I have a credit score. Yeah, I, I, I've never had a credit. I've never bought anything on credit ever. You do? Okay, well, then it's zero. On ways you could improve your score as well. To save more and spend less, join the 3.4 million members using Rocket Money. Yeah, We've got the hookup. Yeah, Go to rocketmoney.com slash nakyjakey or click the link in the description to get started for free or unlock even more features with premium. That's rocketmoney.com slash nakyjakey to get started for free. Get your money right! All right, now let's get on back to Naked Jake in the curious case of the floating rake. <laughs> this, guy, this guy never even. I don't have a mortgage. I I don't have any loans at all. Um, I don't have a credit card. I don't have a car under my name. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have any of that. Mobile bill? Uh, I do have to pay a mobile bill. Eat Digimon World 2. That's a real Souls game. I'm out of here. Dark Souls 2, Bloodborne, and Dark Souls 3 all have much more straightforward progression paths than the first half of Dark Souls 1. And while a lot of areas in these games are technically connected and sometimes offer alternate paths, the general world design is far less interesting from an exploration point of view. And it doesn't I do mean think that Dark Souls 1, especially, again, the first half of Dark Souls 1 is better than any before and any after in terms of exploration and open-ended gameplay. I do think it's the best. That these games are bad. Uh, All of these games probably each deserve their own 40-minute feature presentation, movie. breaking them down, but for the sake of what I want to get into today, I'm just going to give you the Spark Notes version. Dark Souls 2 dropped in 2014 and was received well and sold well. It further grew the Souls oh. game community and deepened combat systems while adding oh, stuff like no. power stances. Miyazaki didn't direct this one, and it does show. The atmosphere of each zone feels a bit random and unconnected from oh. the overall world, but the boss fights and DLCs are great and the game enjoyed a oh, large what do you online mean? community. It's not good, bro. That's the word. Like, how does everybody simp for this fucking boss fight? Like, am I the only person that, like, whenever I see this fuck, like, where the fuck does this sword end? How do I know that I'm avoiding it? What the fuck is this? Like, are you kidding me? Get the fuck out of here. They need to remake this game. I think that Dark Souls 2 can be really good because it has, like, that sense of. It's like the most. There's, like, a certain level of, like, it's compelling in a way. I don't know what it is about it, but it's thematic. Yeah, it is charm. Yeah, I wish they would remake the game and actually make it good large online community for shit like PvP. Bloodborne was developed alongside Dark Souls 2 and was released exclusively for the PS4 in 2015, and I used money- I still money like that. Isn't that funny? That's so funny. Yeah. From a car accident to buy a PS4 in Bloodborne instead of paying my rent. And contrary to what my financial advisors Good might call. be saying and, and Logan Roy looking ass, I'd say it was a wise investment. Directed by Miyazaki, Bloodborne felt like the true follow-up to Dark Souls 1. At least for people like me that just want to swing a big sword yeah. and fucking parry everything. Bye bye magic, go back to fucking Waverly Place. Faster combat that rewards aggressive play. Intricate and varied weapon movesets. An atmosphere that just drips out of your TV with such dedicated attention to detail and well, I think that like a big thing is like, there were a lot of new combat mechanics in uh in bloodborne like I, I i think there was a very it was you played bloodborne very differently than you played dark souls and i like that talent in the art design department and rats dark souls 3 dropped in 2016 and by this point the souls series was popping oh, and yeah. beloved by many people directed once again by miyazaki ds3 did everything right on paper it kept some yep. of the faster paced combat and up enemy designs and boss transformations from Bloodborne, while also returning an expansive armory of weapons and magic lending to a buttload of different kinds of builds. It has a large amount of fan service and callbacks to Dark yep. Souls 1 and some of the hardest bosses seen in a Souls game yet. It also yeah. just feels really, really good to play and situation. looks beautiful, but also something about this formula was starting to feel just a little bit stale. Don't get me wrong, playing through Dark Souls 3, especially doing co-op bo I think that um, personally, I think Dark Souls 3 is a better game than Dark Souls 1, but I think that Dark Souls 1 is my favorite of the three. Like there's something about Dark Souls 1 
that just had a little bit more texture to it that made me enjoy it more but i would say that if you compare them like all things considered i feel like they're kind of equivalent boss fights with my brother was some of the most fun i've had in any of these games but that strong so sense of yeah. exploration felt in yeah. dark souls like let me let me give you guys a make sure you guys understand thinking that dark souls 1 is the best in the series is good Thinking that Dark Souls 3 is the is the best in the series is also good. Thinking that Dark Souls 2 is the best in the series, that's a wrong opinion and you're banned. Okay? One, that feeling yeah, of you charting your that, way that, through that's a just mysterious wrong. and dangerous world, I You're longed for that. The Dark Souls series had completely shaken the game industry and clearly inspired other developers mm -hmm. to change how their games were designed True. and played. But playing Dark Souls 3 felt a bit like listening to From Software's greatest hits versus hearing the band's new album that would maybe take them someplace new. Little did I, I- I actually don't agree with that. I actually think that Dark Souls 3, yes, it did have a callback to the Asylum Demon. That's definitely true. But it, it also, I mean, keep in mind, the Asylum Demon was a callback to the uh, the Demon Vanguard, uh, which was the, the first boss in uh, the Demon Souls cutscene or the Demon Souls uh, like a uh, prelude, right? And then you encounter it later on uh, as you're going towards the Adjudicator. And then later in the series, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but uh, the Erd Tree Sentinels or not? Yeah, yeah, the Erd Tree Guardians, the big tree guys with the do the do the thing. Those are Asylum Demons. Yeah, the Avatars. Yeah, there you go. That's what they're called, Avatars. Yeah, they're the same thing. I think that, yes, they did have some greatest hits callbacks, but I never felt like it was overbearing to the extent that it was, like, weird. And I think that some of the callbacks that they had, right, because, like, the Nameless King is supposed to be, like, Gwen's firstborn son, and it's like there's, like, a whole lore behind that. A lot of the callbacks to Dark Souls 1 are way more esoteric. Like, these are things that are... You're not even going to know this unless you watch a 40-minute video about it. So I think that, yes, of course, they reuse some NPCs and some bosses, but I think you can apply all of that to Elden Ring, too. And I don't think that it took away from the game at all. I know From Software was in the studio working on their In Rainbows, as in the album In Rainbows by Radiohead, as in Radiohead's best album, as in Elden Ring. It's so weird. Some of you might be wondering, like, when did I Jacob Matthew, like, why uh, did it I take you? I remember when I watched it, like 2018 or something like that, 2019. And then finally, it was so crazy to think Elden Ring came out three years later. So long to make a video on Elden Ring. And I have two answers for you. A, last year I was very busy working on an album called Rom Com. Shout out jakeymerch.com. And B, this game is just too damn big and yeah. felt too daunting to dissect and talk about. And I also just wanted to keep playing it, but I feel like I'm finally ready to get into it with my support group. Uh, that's you. This is you. This is all of you. Where do I even begin though? Elden Ring isn't perfect, but that's also what makes it so compelling. It's not properly balanced. I mean, none of these games are. They never have been. FromSoft has pretty yes, clear- Yes, they have never been balanced. Please, thank you so much. These games have always been clown shows. There have always been OP items. Like, it's like people say Sekiro. Oh, right. You ever use the Mortal Blade? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's It's- Real fucking challenging. Your favorites when it comes to certain weapons and buffs and spells. You can absolutely break these games in half if you really want to. But the sheer depth of content that Elden Ring slowly unveils to you during your 200 or so hours of playing it. The childhood fantasy of exploring a fantastical, magical yeah. world filled with swords and beasts and, you guessed it, rats, is fully manifested in a way that knows no contemporary. There is yeah. no other Elden Ring than Elden Ring. This isn't just... No, no it's... Yeah, because, yeah, that's actually true. Yeah, very good point.
the Dark Souls of Dark Souls. This is the Dark Souls of Breath of the Wild. This is the Dark yeah. Souls of Red Dead Redemption 2. If you took a time machine back to 2003 and showed my wooden sword in the backyard swinging ass that, that this is what was coming in the future, I would have shot you in the head and called the cops. <laughs> Elden Ring is truly the adventure. Yo, y'all remember that one clip when McConnell got knocked off the fucking bridge? Holy shit, that was a good one truly the adventure of a lifetime. But because I've already spent so much time talking about the core design pillars that all of these games share, I want to instead focus on certain pillars that Elden Ring innovates room. on or potentially fails to innovate on. Exploration and scale, dungeons and dragons, starring Chris Pine, and difficulty and accessibility. Where Dark Souls 1's world is like a short stack of pancakes all connected, Elden Ring's world is like a giant stack of pancakes and you took all those pancakes and you spread them yeah, out across yeah, a giant table and most of the pancakes are touching each other and some of the pancakes have other pancakes hiding underneath them and other pancakes might transport you to far pancakes, pancakes yeah. in f***ed up ways and some of the pancakes are on fire and make you feel fear. I don't want to be in this Denny's anymore. Let me out! Miyazaki has stated that Elden Ring is the closest thing to his ideal game that he would personally like to play. And they That's why they stopped. That's why I, I don't know, like, I don't know if they're going to make an Elden Ring 2. You know what I mean? I feel like, and I bet the guys at From Software probably know this. They're like, man, this one was really good. Yeah, I don't know if we can do this again. <laughs> open world enriches this ideal experience yeah, that he's about trying it. to achieve. A game where if you saw something over there, you could actually go yeah, you over go there. there. A game that isn't open world just to be in the same category as some bloated Ubisoft bullshit, but a game that's open oh, world bro, because it needs there. to be. In order to fully capture the fantasy yeah. of being an adventurer in a giant world, riding across a vast landscape on your trusty steed, you first need to have that vast landscape to really nail that feeling. Elden Ring was inspired by Breath of the Wild and it very clearly shows because like Breath of the Wild, Elden Ring knows and expects that your curiosity will naturally lead you to finding interesting things. There doesn't need to be an overwhelming list of things to check off or obvious map markers going over here. Go over here, you have to go over to here and then click the special item. Okay, good job. That's number one of 443. If you do all of them, you get an achievement. It's fucking over here. Because that would totally rob the player of a true sense of mystery and discovery when exploring this massive world. Elden Ring is very okay with hiding its hand. Yep. This is what the map looks like when you start the game, and this is what it looks like when you finish the game. And these are the pancakes that are cooking yeah, underneath you the say, entire time. Yeah, Having a chest throw areas. a smoke grenade at you in the starting area and being transported and waking up in one of the most giant late game areas and checking the map and seeing it zoom out like that was an experience I will never forget. Yeah, and it's fucking badass. Lore behind the lands between is so rich in detail and intrigue. Miyazaki's style of storytelling through gameplay combined with the Bible of world history that George R. R. Martin developed for this game will leave an MF feeling like goddamn Amy Adams, as in downright enchanted. I know I haven't mentioned Sekido once in this video because it's- I, I do feel like, as I said, I, I think that Elden Ring, there are some people that, you know, they think that it makes their personality more interesting to talk about why Elden Ring isn't a perfect and amazing. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I think it's perfect and amazing. Oh, not perfect, but it's good enough that it's pretty much perfect. Yeah, that's it. I do think, however, if you want to talk about a perfect game, Sekiro is a perfect game. There's nothing about Sekiro that's wrong. It is a game that is like, you know, Elden Ring's this big, Sekiro is this big, but this is really good. Technically not a Souls game, but it was a crucial stepping stone towards Elden Ring's development. The addition of a dedicated jump button may yeah. sound like a simple thing, but it completely changes combat and the way it you did. navigate this world. For me. Exploring the lands between over like 200 hours rivaled the experience I had exploring mm. the first half of Dark Souls 1. They yeah. both hit really hard, but I think that if I had like the thing is for me, like obviously Dark Souls 1 exploration was a lot different. But I think that if I had started playing Elden Ring first and then I had done Dark Souls, 
I would have felt the opposite, where, like, Elden Ring had that same level of, like, massive, large-scale exploration that it's like you just accidentally find a massive area. For different reasons. The first half of Dark Souls 1 hits hard because of a lack of a yep. fast travel safety net, meaning you become very intimate with your surroundings and the world design nearly That's suffocates true. you with its complexity. It suffocates in a good way. <laughs> Elden Ring hits hard not only because it marks the return first, of yeah. multiple areas connecting to each other with a very non-linear path of progression, but because of just the sheer scale of the world. But because the sheer scale and intrigue of always wanting to see what's around the next corner is such a big part of this experience, much like Breath of the Wild, the game won't ever hit quite as hard on subsequent playthroughs because that main draw of dis Yeah, I mean, you already export everything that's fine though and it's like i remember i i do remember remember whenever mcconnell and i did the playthrough the the co-op playthrough and we were doing the playthrough and he was showing me all the other areas in stormvale castle that i missed dude i will never fucking forget that that was such a badass fucking stream because it was like one of those things where like I thought I knew everything about the game and then he showed me like oh wow there's like this whole area with like a crucible knight another one of the, I think the scions there there's like Godric at the bottom or not God Godwin at the bottom and like you you I, oh my fucking god it was so good Discovery is no longer there. This doesn't mean you shouldn't play multiple yeah. playthroughs of this game because, oh my god, weapons and spells and armor sets and ashes of war and summoning summoning salt videos. Quest lines that you can super easily miss and you will because yeah. they're super convoluted and hard to follow. You should definitely play the game a second time. But I will say that on my second playthrough, I definitely wasn't as eager to revisit all of the content once I knew what was exactly around every corner. Elden. Yeah, I think Elden ring is like it does an amazing job at a first playthrough but i don't think that it has the same replay value as dark souls or dark souls 3 ring has a massive amount of unique and amazing content to experience but there's also some super not amazing content in there too and joseph anderson's review bro was i completely agree i completely fucking agree there's some real bullshit in this game, and it, some of it is just wrong. There's also some super yeah. not amazing content in there too. In Joseph Anderson's review, which is great by the way, he talks about how amazing his first fight with a dragon was. And I yeah. completely agree, that first encounter with a dragon in that big ass wet field or whatever, and he's like breaking all of the physics objects, it's amazing. It's such an awesome gameplay moment that is just naturally experienced in your exploring of the world. Yeah, but this I was insane. And like the fact that you did this in like a couple of hours of starting the game was even more insane. Watching this makes me want to go back and play the Convergence mod. I downloaded it and everything, I just haven't played it yet. I also agree with Joseph's point that because the game ends up having like a billion other dragons that you find, there's seriously so many dragons and they yeah. all mostly have the same moveset. It kind of takes away- I think there's like two different dragon types. There's like the dragons with two wings and the dragons with like four or six wings bit of the those oomph did, of that first different. experience. It doesn't mean that first experience is invalidated or made bad, but more so it's like if you ate pizza for dinner every night and eventually you were like, all right, I don't really want to eat dragon pizza anymore. Can, can we have like rat pizza, mom? The same goes for a lot of Elden Ring's catacomb. Uh, we used to have pepperoni pizza every fucking day at school. Every fucking day at school dungeons. Similar to the chalice dungeons in Bloodborne or the shrines in Breath of the Wild, the quality of experience you might have in one of these copy-paste interiors is a bit of a dice roll. In all of the Souls games, you never know exactly what items you're going to find as rewards while exploring, but the areas and bosses are usually so interesting to look at and explore that the real reward is really just getting to experience that area and fight that cool boss. So even if the reward- I remember whenever I fought that boss on the stream and I had a broken weapon and I killed him in one try.
Ward is something you're never gonna use, like another fucking spell. You don't really regret doing it because it was a really cool experience. The same does not apply to Elden Ring. All of these catacombs are not created equally. Some will have a cool and unique boss and a really useful piece of loot. And yep. others will have a boss you've already seen a bunch of times this and an sucker. item that you will forget about the second you leave the catacomb. Funny enough, this is actually a problem that's remedied by a second playthrough. Because if you have a wiki open, you can just avoid doing all the dungeons that aren't worth it. But on a first playthrough, the one that's the best and the most memorable, you don't know what all of these have. So if you're like me, you're probably- You have to do all of them. Yeah, you, you have to do every single one. If it's there, you have to do it. Probably going to do all of them yeah. and get pretty burnt out on fighting the same little statue fuckers in these pieces of shit. For the most part, the enemy and boss variety on display in Elden Ring will blow your back out most of the time. But seeing unique experiences that you've cherished, like the reveal Astiel. and spectacle yeah. of fighting Astel, natural boy of the void, get copy pasted into a separate dungeon, or fighting a godskin fucker, both of them for like the fifth time. I think at least this one makes sense, but there is some element, he's right, that there is an element of Dark Souls 2 boss design, where it's the boss again. There it is. It's a bit disappointing. Yep. The nice thing about Elden Ring, though, is that you technically don't have to do most of this. Right. If a boss is too hard or if an area is too annoying for you, you have so many other options of things to do and bosses to fight and places to see. But this also potentially leads to some issues with the game's design. Previous Souls games that had a more linear progression path could quickly halt your progress with a super tough boss. Yeah. And you would have to either grind enemy mobs for sure. souls to level up or just slam so your head against the wall until you hopefully eventually break through. Elden Ring being mostly non-linear actually remedies that problem and finally adds a sort of difficulty slider to the Souls games. If a boss is- I feel like in terms of difficulty sliders, Bloodborne and Sekiro were kind of the hardest, I would say. And then after that, I'm not really sure what else I would go with. Because like it was harder to over-level in those games than any of the other ones giving you a swirly, just go do something else. Maybe find a better weapon, learn some new yep. skills, or spend time practicing your parries against weaker bosses. I don't know, there's a lot of stuff you could do. Then once you're better prepared, head on back to that boss that was f***ing you up and say, it's opposite day, you slug. Huzzah! That's pretty amazing, right? Yeah, this makes the game so much more accessible and less intimidating to a new player that's- Yeah, I think that's one of the big achievements. Like, Elden Ring does have a difficulty uh, toggle. Like, the game is not very hard, and I actually think that Elden Ring can be, it can be simultaneously the hardest and the easiest game that they've made. Never been beaten to death by a rat before. But this system of sort of choosing your own difficulty could also potentially rob you of a compelling experience. This yeah. game is so goddamn big that there's bound to be stuff in the early areas that you won't find until way later in the game. And when you do find it, maybe you it's a super awesome, it. unique boss battle with like a really cool reward that you beat in like two hits. In some cases, this feels amazing. It yeah, fully it feeds into the power fantasy of wanting to make the biggest fucker alive and can be super satisfying to just totally fart on a boss that once had you breaking two by fours from Menards over your leg. But sometimes yeah. it can feel underwhelming and disappointing. I think the fact that the game doesn't have level scaling for enemies is much better than an alternative where it did. Because levels- Yeah, I think that, yeah, the game does not need level scaling. This is not a live service, like simultaneous online game. Yeah, it does not need that. Scaling can often make a game world feel pretty artificial and your progression feel pretty meaningless. But I do think there's a world where you could have a bit of both. I think if you visit areas in the game that you're very obviously over leveled for, the game could maybe flash a little prompt that says, hey, do you wanna make this fight scale to your level to maybe make it a bit more satisfying and maybe we give you extra runes as a reward for upping the difficulty? I would love that. Mark Brown of Game Maker Stool Like, theoretically, right, how would this work in, in reality? Is it like there'd be a fog wall, 
and then next to the fog wall there would be like an a, a device that maybe you could interact with and then the interaction could change the difficulty of the boss fight i don't know i can see what he's saying but i don't know if the game needs something like that bonfire aesthetics yeah it makes a great point in his video about how Demon, Hollow Knight yeah. actually changes the layout of early areas and ups the difficulty of enemies to keep things more challenging yeah, and interesting later in the game. And I think that's a great example of something that Elden Ring could have potentially done as well. Speaking of rune rewards for defeating enemies, holy shit, they are all over the place yep. in this game and make like zero fucking sense. Donkey talks about this in his Elden Ring video and I wholeheartedly agree. Like the difficulty of an enemy does not not correlate to how much money you get for defeating them. It's honestly ridiculous in a lot of cases. <laughs> also, let's talk about respecking stat points. Once you defeat Renala at the Wizard Academy Raya Lucaria, you unlock a way to use specific larval tier items to reallocate all of the stat points that you've spent money on, and this is amazing. This means that if you find a weapon or spell that you really fuck with but don't have the stats for, I'm you gonna can give an unpopular opinion. I wish that you didn't have to upgrade weapons. That's right. Here's why. I don't want to use the same weapon through the entire playthrough. But when my weapon is the best weapon, because it's the strongest, it makes me not want to try new weapons that I get because I know that it will be a de facto downgrade because it's not upgraded. I'm fine, guys. I'm fine with it being a mod. Many mods have this feature. I'm not saying it has to be implemented into the base game. But this is what I like. Retool your character to be able to use them and switch up your playstyle and experience one of the many amazing builds that you can do in this game. So why the f can't you do the same thing with weapons? Elden Ring offers no yeah. way of transferring or respecking oh, weapons. So now he's going to complain about the same thing I am. Yes, yeah, see, exactly. So true. So true. It's only wrong because of limited resource. Yeah, but like, uh, like I, I think your limited resource argument goes out the window whenever you have ball bearing books, right? And upgrades from one weapon to another and it makes zero so sense right. to me you find so, so many right. fucking cool so weapons true. in this game and it is a total totally. pain in the ass to make switching to them so actually true. viable so yes right. you can find the smithing bells that let you buy an unlimited amount of upgrade resources from the merchant yes. but a what if you don't they? find some of those bells on your first yeah. playthrough where you're not looking stuff up and b i don't understand what the harm would be in letting you get back some of your your upgrade resources from a weapon if it meant that that weapon went back to its base level right you would be so much yeah i mean i get it I, I think that like look i get why they don't have you do it i understand it but i also really appreciate the mods and it's not the thing is people say it's too casual uh-uh brother uh-uh brother it's the opposite it's that I want to challenge myself with different types of techniques rather than using the exact same one for the entire game. Much more excited to find shit, even if it's something out of your typical wheelhouse. The Resident Evil 4 remake, which is fantastic, by the way, I talk about it on my second channel, Jaquan the Jeek will like, subscribe, rate, comment, <laughs> five stars, lets you sell weapons you've upgraded back to the merchant, and you get most of the money that you've put into upgrading that weapon, which is amazing. So why can't Elden Ring have the same thing? Another thing that can feel so... I think the reason why they do it is because they want people to go through subsequent playthroughs with different weapons and they want to have a sense of, uh, you know, investment into a certain type of character. And it's a single player game, so I can understand that. Like, again, like, I, the reason I want this, and like, as I said, I'm totally fine with this just being a mod. But I wish that it was like that because it would give me more ways to play the game. That's all.
as backwards and outdated are the NPC side quests and how you progress them. These games have always had super convoluted NPC side quests, and I know it's partly because Miyazaki knows that with the internet, everyone's gonna yeah, get together and figure it out so you can afford to make it complicated and whatever. I, I get that. But I still think that some of these more basic ones should be doable by just using your common sense. It's one thing to have NPCs not progress their dialogue or do something until you go rest or leave the area when it's a smaller, more linear game but yeah. it's an entirely different thing to have that same bullshit in a massive open world game where people are supposed to move around from place to place but will never do it while you're watching them so you gotta go rest at a bonfire and then wait no wait I'm and again keep in mind none of this matters because people the game is so good that people will look it up ahead of time and figure it out anyway because they will seek out the content because of the quality of the game and that's why, again, graphics, who gives a fuck? Uh, you know, the story, who fucking knows? But the gameplay, that's what matters. Rest up, you gotta rest again to load the guy in because it's not nighttime if you rested and then died and then came back. Like, what the f yeah, I went annoying. where the fucker told me to. Why does this require so many other extra unseen steps? I only bitch and moan about this because the writing and voice acting well. in this game oh, yeah, yeah. is so, so good. Like, so heartbreakingly good. And because the storytelling and lore bits are so game. few and yeah. far between, you'll fucking chase after whatever scraps you can find. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, at the that, end of the day, exactly I make these videos to criticize the things that I love. Video games. I love them so, so, so very much. And I think I that, like, really, I mean, I think oftentimes whenever people give feedback, and this is the same thing with kind of like what I'm saying, is that maybe like the player's solutions aren't necessarily the best solution for the game. But I think giving feedback to developers so they can understand, like, because a good developer will understand not what the player wants, but what they need, right? And this is something that World of Warcraft used to do very well. And it's something that good game developers with insight into their games are able to discern and figure out. Like Jeff Kaplan, for example, said that you can't rely on the players to provide you with a solution, but that you can sure as hell rely on them to provide you with a problem. Or tell you if there's a problem. Of Elden Ring more than most other video games. I am so eternally grateful to be alive in the same timeline that From Software is cranking out yeah, games true. of this quality. Elden Ring is not only a continuation of the Dark Souls franchise, it is an evolution of From Software's trailblazing game design. A design that I think defined the last 10 years of gaming, and with Elden Ring, could very well define the next 10 years of gaming as well. A massive journey with some of the most beautiful vistas I've seen since- Well, I think that it's also, uh, it's also a return to form because a lot of video games used to play like this. Minimal bullshit, all gameplay. And then things started to change in like the PS3 era, I would say, and they became much more narrative experiences. Yeah, Zelda. Zelda is a great example. Link, go to the castle. There's your uncle. Get the sword. Okay. Well, go get him. What are you? What, what the fuck are you doing here? Let's go. You know, that's it. Windows Vista and some of the past, most yeah. challenging, grueling bosses that's that I've taken on them. and overcome since Windows Vista. Thank you to Hidetaka Miyazaki and From Software for taking a chance yeah, with Demon real. Souls. Thank you for making some of my favorite games ever made. And thank you for watching this video. What a nice I'll see video. you later, What a gamers. nice guy. Wow. <laughs> Why did you act like that? Okay, uh, yeah, I'm so glad that I watched this. I, I know I've wanted to watch this for a while. I remember when it came out, and I was like, oh, fuck, I gotta watch this. Um, th this is such a good video. I, I, I what, a, what a great video. I, 
I was very, very, like, I mean, as I said, I was so glad he brought up the weapon thing, the enchants and all that. I, 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 I love these games. I love the content. And I think, again, it's a return to form to what gaming really used to be, right? It isn't some cinematic experience that's meant for C-grade writers that couldn't make it into Hollywood to still have their stories be told. It's just solid, good gameplay against hard bosses with fulfilling combat. That's it.